Monomythics. Welcome to Monomythic. I'm Kevin Garcia, professional comic book historian, and I am here today with two indie classic, indie comic classic greats, uh, the creators of El Gato Negro and El Muerto. El Gato Negro creator Richard E. Dominguez and uh, El Muerto creator Javier Hernandez both gained great acclaim in the 90s and, and early 2000s with their small press comics, which became indie movie hits. Uh, uh, why say hits? Critically acclaimed indie, independent movies that were made. Uh, and I want to welcome both of them right now. So, guys, how we doing? Hey, good. I'm here in Austin, Texas. Uh, welcome, Javier, from Los Angeles. And Richard, you are in Luxembourg right now? Luxembourg, right there, right wedge between uh, Belgium and Germany. <laughs> also, happy belated birthday, Javier, and happy belated anniversary, Richard. Both of you guys had a big week. <laughs> yes, yeah, thanks, yes, yeah. that's right. Hey, happy birthday, Hob, man. Yeah, happy anniversary. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for having us. And this is the most appropriate social distancing, right? This is several thousands of miles, so we're good. Yeah, I, I think it's harder to get farther away than we are from Richard right now. So, yeah, yeah. Richard, don't get us sick. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm a night owl. It's, you know, way past my, my bedtime. But then again, and we artists, we have no set hours of sleep. Right. That's right. Well, Richard, uh, let me talk to you real quick and uh, bring up El Gato Negro, which uh, started in the, the early 90s. This was a, a time when there was a lot of, of a push for independent comics and uh, this is around the time that, that image was becoming a big deal and you just really just came out of the gate uh throwing full punches because these were just really really amazing uh what uh what made you want to start el gato in, in those uh, in those days well uh at the time i wanted to do artwork for another a uh, for another comic uh, latino comic creator uh judge margarito garza who came up with relampago and uh, I found his book at a uh, at a twenty five cent bin at half price books, and uh, and the the inside of the cover still had his inf contact info. So I called him up and uh, asked him if I could uh, be uh, the artist and revive his character. He was into it, uh, but uh, he, he being a criminal judge in Corpus Christi kept him busy, and uh, and he also had his own comic book store in Corpus Christi. So he does that on a weekend when he's not sending uh, felons to, to prison, you know, so. <laughs> and uh, and then the one day uh, I became a guest at his comic book store and uh, someone said, well, you should come up with your own uh, you know, comic book superhero. So uh, that's what was born uh, El Gato Negro in the early 90s. And now, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Judge Garza was was a big influence on a lot of us. I'm actually curious about your artistic influences as well. Uh, I, I look at your early work and I see a lot of uh, like John Byrne and, and uh, Walt Simonson kind of inspiration with the the characters, faces and movements and, and the sound effects. But then your your more recent work has become really, really super polished. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious what uh, what led to that kind of development. Well, I, I needed to uh, identify myself as, as my own Uh uh, because I was heavy, like you said, I was heavy in influence with with John Byrne and uh, uh, Sal uh, Basima, and uh, even uh, uh, the early Batman uh, artists on there, uh, Marshall Rogers, uh, there uh, back in the seventies, and then so I kind of you know did a splicing of here and there, and then uh, came up with my own style there uh, to give uh, I. El Gato Negro, his own identification. And Javier, I'm going to jump to you for a second. Um, what was the genesis behind El Muerto? How did how did this get started? You you first published in 1998, correct? Yeah, my first issue was, uh, the one you were showing is like a second edition. The first one was just all black and white photocopied. It was totally, you know, done as bare bones as you can. But um, in the mid-90s, I had wanted, you know, getting that self-publishing bug. Um, I always loved comics, um, but because I had read enough of the history of comics, I didn't have a big, um, I wasn't super excited about like entering the actual comic book field, like working for the big two. Um, you know, we don't need to go through all the horror stories. I'm sure we've all, you know, know our comic history or look into it, but yeah. 
um, I did want to make my own comics. So, of course, there was a big independent comic scene. I mean, you go back to, um, well, Judge Margarito obviously started his, you know, Relampago in the mid-70s, I think, early 70s. Yeah, 70s, 77. Mm -hmm. 77, and, of course, the Ninja Turtles explosion. Um, so I figured, you know what, I'm going to do comics, but I'm going to do my comics, my characters. And um, growing up, I loved all the comics, like we all did, Spider-Man, Batman, all that. But if I'm going to make my own comic, I really was interested at that moment to do something reflective of my, of my own Mexican background. So I ended up looking into Aztec mythology, like in Day of the Dead folklore, which you didn't see a lot of in the mainstream entertainment media. Yeah. Um, um, and then, of course, I, I got, let me try to research indie comics. And is there any Latinos making their own comics? So I came across two. One, Carlos Saldana does a comic burrito. And the other one is uh, sitting here on the screen with us, Richard Dominguez. Um, I was—I remember I was at the Long Beach Public Library just looking through magazines, and I saw that you know it's a Hispanic Monthly or whatever. And, oh, let me yeah. look through this, you know. And then I go, "What's this little article here?" Uh, you know, Latino comic creator Richard Dominguez, El Gato Negro. I was like, "Oh wow!" I go, "Check it out." There's a Mexican American making his own comic of his own character. Um, so yeah, that was really exciting. Um, this was. You know, internet might have been up and around, but yeah, it's not like you could just email Richard. But I just went home with that idea of his comic, and then I found out about Carlos Saldana's comic. And I told my friend Rafael Navarro, who does a comic called Sonambulo. It's like he was also, he had already worked for Marvel and DC, had done some other uh, smaller publisher stuff. But it's like, hey, you know what? It's okay. It's okay to make your own comic based on like a specific cultural background if that's what you're interested in. So by 98, you know, after a couple of years of working on that first book, in between, you know, coming home from work and weekends and trying to squeeze it in on lunch break, um, I got that first issue out. So it's been uh, 22 years since, and um, it's been fantastic uh, odyssey up and down all the way. And it's, you know, another 22 or 44, if I'm, you know, God willing. I actually wanted to ask you guys about some of that community because you, you mentioned uh, Burrito and uh, in, in your first, well, at least the reprint edition I have in that book, you have Burrito there in a little pinup kind of sending you off on your way. And then uh, in, in Richard's book, we have Panda Khan by Dave Garcia, uh, who is a, another character that I was a big fan of in the, in the 80s indie comics. Uh, how did you guys get these these influences that you had to show up in your books? Well, uh, uh, if if I may, uh, I met uh, Dave Garcia back in uh, in the early '90s out there in San Diego, and uh, he was at he was at Artist Alley, and he had a table space right next to him, and he asked me to sit down right next to him and. Uh, I was just amazed at how he had quite a, a line of people, you know, asking for, you know, to sketch something for for, for them. And uh, he also was a, a powerful influence towards me. And uh, I, at that time, I was handing out my flyers announcing El Gato Negro for, of the following year. And I gave him one, and he gave me encourage. He said, it's a jungle out there. And that's what it says on the uh, pinup that uh, he did for me. And uh, to this day, I still get in touch with Dave, and uh, he's doing well. And uh, he's uh, very happy of, 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 you know, how far I've gotten on there. So uh, he, will, he was right there at the, at the stepping stones of, of my career. And then, Javier, you, you also got uh, several pinups in yours as well? At least, like I said, the reprint I have. Yeah, actually, so I, I, you know, when I got to meet Richard, I did, I guess, Richard, I guess we did meet at San Diego Comic Con. Yes, right? yes, yes, I remember, yeah. Yeah, you were set up there. So Richard was part of an early group that was, uh, that started up back then called uh, Pacas. Yes. Um, pro 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 professional Amigo Cartoon Art Society. Yes, and yes. And it's like, Love that. yeah, it's like Richard's alluding to, just collective of these different independent creators um, they got together just to kind of have a presence at shows and such. Um, so that's, you know, when I met Richard, I met a lot of these other folks, too, at the time. And it was really exciting, right? Like, okay, you know what? I kind of feel welcome, you know, because a lot of these creators in that group, they were Latino or other uh, creators of color. And, um, you know, it felt like, okay, you know, this is exciting. This is going to be fun to get into. So, um, and yeah, you know, you just meet people at shows or whatever. You meet them at bookstores and you just, you know, so you swap pinups or... Uh, 
collaborate when you can, whenever. That's right. Mostly, mm -hmm. it's just, mostly it's just partnering up, like, on road trips and sharing table space, you know, next to each other at a convention. Because ultimately, really, indie creators, you're really responsible just for your own work and yourself. Um, you should not rely on anybody else. And the other people should not be relying on you or expecting things from you. So um, it's not about not helping other people, but it's an indie creator. You got, you know, Richard talked about the jungle. It, it is, it's still a jungle out there. And mm -hmm. it's not just the external forces. It's sometimes yourself where you don't get up and do the work or you don't want to go here or there. So the more you focus, if you're just a one person creator, the more you just focus on getting your next book done, you're going to be in better shape ultimately. And of course, keep professional friendly relationships with everybody else and, you know, as you come across them. But. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, and back then, you know, uh, Javier, uh, the the Latino community was with, you know, they stuck together. They they support one, one you know, one another of, of their creations. And, and, I, and I would know this because of uh, Javier, uh, showing support. Javier was one of the first cosplayers back in the early 90s, uh, dressed up as Sonambolo. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. I did dress up as Raphael. I'd love to see those pictures. Yeah. So, and uh, that, but, and then he showed the, the true essence of the character Brick come to life out of the comic book pages and in front of everybody here in, during, uh, in San Diego. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, I wish I had pictures of it back then. Uh, but he was one of the first cosplayers back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Javier. Like a year before I started self publishing. So, yeah. yeah. Really? Know. Yeah. Well, good, perfect timing then. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Javier, I was going to ask you a little bit about your influences as well. I look at a lot of your early stuff, and it, it had a lot of influence of, this is one of your newer ones, I think, but had, your early stuff had a lot of influence of uh, the underground comics that really just drew from the, the emotion and imagination. And a lot of your more modern stuff seems to follow a lot of the, the crisp, clean artwork of Mike Alred or, or the more cosmic stuff of uh, Jim uh, Starlin. And I want to ask, you know, what, uh, what has influenced your development as an artist? Well, yeah, you know, um, yeah, definitely there's growth, right, from anybody from their first book to their later stuff. Um, you know, from the originally, like my two my two beacons, they're my two North Stars in comics, and even to this day, they were Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. Um, just the way they approach their work, their the way their, their relationship through the industry and publishing and such, and, um, and also just their ideas, right, the creative idea machine in their head. Um, so those were big influences, but a lot of influences early on came from a lot of stuff on um, like Tim Burton movies, uh, music like The Cure, The Smiths, um, you know, Charles Adams, Adams Family, you know, any, anything that was kind of like not really grotesque, like hard horror, but more like that macabre, maybe I don't know if whimsical is the word, but, you know, really does tell to like Dia de los Muertos. If you look at what it's really about, it's not about, you know, it's not really about like you know, worm infested zombies. It's about these fun, playful skeletons. And it's just really remembering and honoring your, your deceased loved ones that passed on. A lot um, of people see it as morbid, but it's really just fun. Yeah. Yeah. I never really looked at it as like, you know, dark or anything. It's more whimsical and, you know, laughing at death helps you to actually cope with it in some ways. So, I mean, that's always, that was always some of the artistic uh, background or Genesis from, uh, from whence El Muerto sprung. And then uh, both of you guys have have had uh, live action versions of your of your films. I was going to start with uh, Richard. El Gato Negro Prey was uh, released to, to independently uh, what last year, the year before that. With uh, it was in, uh, 20, 20, uh, 2017, I believe it was on there because we did the filming back in uh, twenty sixteen. Um, a film done by uh, Michael Moore, director, as you can see him there, uh, directing actor Conrad Gonzalez uh, on there. He uh, played one of the villains in, in the film. And uh, there is uh, Bobby, Bobby Hernandez, who played uh, Francisco Guerrero, EGN, and uh, Joe Perez, who played the grandfather, uh, Augustin Guerrero, there. And uh, so, both of them captured the essence of the of the characters very well. 
What was the the impetus behind that? Uh, what what made this this film happen? Uh, like I said, uh, Michael, uh, when uh, he was my writer, he he left to pursue other things, which was filmmaking. So he when you he, say your uh, writer, you mean you mean some of the other yeah. independent comics? Like uh, yes, he he was a writer yeah. of uh, of Team Tejas and uh, El Gato Negro Nocturnal Warrior uh, Legacy Book One, and uh, and then he uh, you know like I said he pursued other things and uh, went into filmmaking and uh, produced and directed uh, a few of uh, martial arts films because he was so into that and a big fan of uh, Jackie Chan. And then uh, when they asked him what was his next project, he said, I'm going to do one of El Gato Negro. So uh, he called me up and said, uh, hey, I'd like to do a film uh, based on the character. And, uh, and he knows my character inside out. And, and, and the uh, story so was... Well, the story focused a lot on the the relationship between uh, the grandfather and, and grandson, right? Francisco and um, and Augustine. Oh uh, yes, yes, yeah. So, uh, what did you guys, when you're talking about doing an independent film, you have a very limited budget. What what were the thoughts on on creating that that little prequel, I guess, to your story? Well, it was uh, it was uh, like uh, we decided to do a story on the. Uh, very first adventure of uh, of El Gato Negro before he uh, donned his uh, cat motif costume. Um, his very first one, and uh, and he got his grandfather's blessing to do it. The uh, and and well, of course, you know, at the at the end of the film, he says, "I'm going to need a costume," <laughs> you know. So uh, spoilers. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know, so, uh, and of course, uh, it was like, like the very first tryout uh, to make sure that he uh, had the, the makings to uh, carry his uh, grandfather's mantle on there. It was a lot of fun uh, doing it, and uh, the actors, they, they had a lot of fun uh, as well. Was the, the film released anywhere that people might be able to watch it online now? Uh, I believe Michael has it on what's the name of that video service on there he said he was going to try to uh do it for public viewing pretty soon um and he entered it in in several several film festivals and and got uh some high awards on it and uh, in great praises so that that was that was very good and uh and the actors were of course you know they 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 pushed it as much as they could uh, and entering these film festivals, they were also as guests, like uh, they did uh, in the past uh, Texas Latino Comic Con. On there. Yeah, which is where I saw it, and I uh, will post a link uh, in the in the description once we we get everything finished. Okay. And then Javier, you had yours a few years earlier than that with uh, El Marto, uh, starring. Uh, it's a Brian Cox film, which which I think I, I didn't know he directed that until I went back to it. Starring Wilder Valderrama as, as Diego, and and even had some some Latino greats like uh, Tony Plana and uh, Tony Amandola, Amandola rather. Um, how did that happen? How did that whole thing come together? Yeah, it's not the Brian. It's not Brian Cox, the actor from X Men Two. If that's what you're thinking, it was uh, yes, <laughs> Brian Cox, the independent uh, director producer. Um, yeah, the way that came about was um, mentioned once again, San Diego Comic Con. Um, I did an interview there, and I guess it's, boy, it's 2001, geez, uh, with a reporter from uh, one of the NPR shows. Um, he was just actually, he's, this guy was ahead of his time in 2001, because he was actually looking to interview specifically Latino comic creators. So, you know, this guy was jumping on the bandwagon before there was a bandwagon uh, as far as covering Latino creators. Um, but, you know, I did the interview, you know, it's like a five or ten minutes, right? He sits he sits next to you, does the interview, you know, it takes off, and you're like thinking, okay, that was cool, but I got to get back to work. You know, I got three days of whatever, four days to sell these books. And then eventually he aired that episode. I don't know what show it was, maybe The World or something, but um, he aired it, and of course, one person who heard it, one of the people who heard it was this guy, Brian Cox, who's director, uh, independent director, producer. So he was intrigued by the idea of El Marto, and... Um, he jotted down my got a hold of my contact info from the you know the station and I got a letter back in the day you, you got letters in your PO box. I got a letter from his assistant. Hey, we heard your interview and we're interested in picking up your comics. Where can we get them? And 2001, I was still just I just had the black and white photocopied 
uh, comic and such. So I, I go, well, you know, give me, if you can send me seven dollars, I'll send you the comics. And they did, you know. So it's like, wow, my first check from Hollywood, seven bucks. Um, but to make a real long story short, I had a meeting with Brian at his uh, studio there on Sunset. We talked for about an hour. He had a lot of questions creatively about the concept. And um, some I didn't have answers for because, you know, he's thinking of the whole scope of the character and everything. And I, I was very honest. Maybe maybe they're not used to that in Hollywood. But I go, you know, I haven't thought that far. And he goes, well, I'd like to offer you, you know, I think this would make a great film. And again, I was honest. Well, you know, I don't have a lawyer. Um, he's like, well, try to get one because, you know, we should definitely move forward. So eventually, you know, month, this, and things take months and months. Like he, he took off to took off overseas for another film for, I don't know, six or eight months. So, you know, he comes back. So he got a hold of a producer friend of his, uh, Larry Ratner. Um, and then together they started, you know, looking at it. And then Larry had a, a chance meeting previously with some, uh, a father and his two sons, uh, Leonis. They were wanting to make it. They're like the first movie. They were in music publishing, book publishing. And, you know, like a lot of people with money, hey, we want to make a movie. So it turned out, you know, just the, the chain of events where there's these guys that have money for a film. Um, are my hands on the screen here? Okay. And then there's a producer that has an idea that this director wants to make. And so they made a, you know, made a deal. And eventually we ended up, you know, years, a couple of years later, ended up making that film starring Wilmer Valderrama. And um, I was in a, I was an associate producer on the film and I also snagged myself a little cameo in there. And um, I also did the um, artwork for the main titles. Um, that was something that kind of just came up because um, Brian was saying, he asked me if I would want to do them because he's like, we need to have your art in the titles, but also there's a couple of scenes that I wasn't able to film that maybe you could illustrate them. So they'll be part of, you know, uh, like they're showing that opening scene intercut with the titles. So I not only just had interesting illustrations, but some of the illustrations kind of linked, you know, one scene to another. So it's kind of neat how that worked out. Let me ask you a question. Um, Richard had, with his movie, was working with literally one of his writers. Uh, you, however, were working with Hollywood, basically. Was there, were there any concerns that, uh, or rather, let me phrase that, anything that can't happen that you maybe were not super happy with or, or eh, you wish it could have been differently, but you understood? Yeah, well, this one of the meetings I had with Brian, for me, the whole thing, the whole relationship of the film was is me and Brian, um, Brian Cox, is we had that, you know, there's that artist to artist understanding and such. Um, so, you know, what's the turn? He had my back, I had his back. Um, yeah. But one time at, at his office, he, you know, I said something, I forgot what it was. It was already respectful. And he goes, he's all, hey, look, he's all, whenever you get to start getting the script, whatever, or whenever we're talking about something, Whatever you're not a hundred percent on, like, please let me know. But don't say, don't say, oh, I don't like that. Tell me, oh, I don't think that works because, and that totally makes sense, right? Because you're not just. First of all, you don't have the creative power to say no, right? You're not a, well, hell, even Stephen King or a, maybe J.K. Rowling does on Harry Potter, but no one. It's very rare that any author has any, you know, yes or no power because that will that'll derail the production. Um, so it was always just a, a good communication between me and him. But, you know, ultimately, like, okay, well, the comic, what's the old saying? Like, hey, my books are still on the shelf. Hollywood hasn't done anything to it. It's their film. You know, it's, it's their movie. It's, it's his creative vision. So I was happy to be, you know, I was happy to be the subject of the film. You know, the, my comic is the, uh, you know, the storyline. But um, it, it was a great experience. Like, you know, I worked on the film every day. Um, you know, day and night, and um, got to know the cast and crew. So, and it was a small enough production where it was really like there's the there's the producer, the director, and and me kind of as far as not running the film, but just always collaborating, always talking, like hey, conferencing, whatever. So, I was very fortunate in that regard. I mean, obviously, if it was a giant budget film, you know, I would have had a lot more money, but I would have been sent off to like uh, like Bob Kane says, I would have been sent off to Palm Springs for eight months and then come back when the film's done. Did, uh, well, one thing that got, always got my attention was that it went, sometimes you see it on DVD as the dead one, which that seemed like kind of a forced translation there. Was that something that, uh, yeah, that okay was the, sorry about that. Yeah, that was the original release uh, title. Um, you know, um, I'll just say, yeah, that there were marketing decisions, but 
short about I don't know six months later it was re-released under El Muerto. So there's two DVDs out there, same movie, but the title's Dead One or El Muerto. So little little bit of tiny trivia for everybody there. <laughs> All right. And then, of course, uh, this led, you said Larry Ratner earlier, that led to a, a neat collaboration with him where he was also doing some uh, conventions with you. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. What, yeah. After a couple of years of me doing the Latino Comics Expo, me and my uh, friend Ricardo Padilla, Larry was like, hey, guys, you know, kind of interested in what you're doing there. So he's like, you're interested in taking it out of state? I go, oh, definitely, definitely we are. So then him and his partner, Tim, they, um, we made an agreement to work with them on a show. So they ended up telling us about Brownsville, Texas, uh, Richard's home state there. And um, also where I'm from. Yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. There you go. Your hometown there. So we ended up uh, doing a show there. Oh, I'm really bad with the years. So it's 20, 2018, maybe. I think 2018. 2018, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it was it was fun to get out of the state. And Brownsville, Mel, the, re the reception there was amazing, but and uh, you also did these, uh, these. Um, I was going to say thumbnails. That's not the right word. The storyboards. Storyboard. storyboard. Thank get the word out for a second. The storyboard uh, as a potential for the movie. They didn't end up using it, you said, but you still got to be hands-on. Yeah, the storyboards, hopefully the people can see them. Um, when, when we got the final draft, of the, well, it wasn't the final draft, but it was almost the final draft. And I asked Brian, the director, I go, Brian, hey, would you mind just for, for my own, you know, education if I just storyboard the script, because I never storyboarded. And he goes, sure, go right ahead. Yeah, if you want. He's all, I work with my cinematographer, though. We kind of block out the film ourselves. I go, that's fine. So I did him. It was really funny that I'm reading the script, and I'm getting to the part where they're doing the origin of El Muerto, which is right from the comic. So I'm redrawing the scenes from the movie script that's based on my original comic version. So it was really weird drawing the, uh, those scenes again. Uh, going back to the scene of the crime, so to speak, but through somebody else's uh, perspective. <laughs> now, uh, Richard, I was talking to Javier about how that kind of his project kind of expanded into also this Comic Con that was done in Brownsville and and led to uh, further partnerships. Uh, yours has also led to some future projects. What's going on with uh, El Gato Negro potentially in the future? Well, right now. Uh MGM is going to be uh, producing uh, the uh, TV series for Apple TV. And uh, this is, is, a, is a, a big surprise for me. Uh, and, of course, Robert Rodriguez uh, is going to be directing the, the pilot. But uh, the, the one who uh, was the, the brainchild of all that was, uh, was uh, director filmmaker Joe Novia. Who uh, who directed uh, several episodes of Arrow, and including the debut of uh, Deathstroke, which was one of the most uh, sought uh, episodes uh, during that season. And uh, Joe Novia was uh, I don't date myself, but uh, he was a big fan of the book and said that he wanted once he get into filmmaking, he wanted to uh, you know create the film for it. He uh, got in touch with me back in February of, of 2018. And uh, so we, uh, you know, put a package together for him to uh, push it. And then uh, it was MGM that called me personally. And uh, it was uh, uh, Andrew Mittman, who was with MGM, uh, gave me a call and said, hey, uh, we're interested in uh, your El Gato Negro. Told Joe about it, and uh, he uh, when he was in in in, uh, in the West Coast at the time, and uh, and represented me there to uh, to pitch it to N MGM, and of course uh, they they got it, and uh, here we are, and and they got the uh, the actor who played Luis Miguel uh, Diego Bonera to uh, play the lead role of it, and that's where uh, he kind of brought in uh, Robert Rodriguez into the fix to uh to do the the directing of the the pilot that's soon to come so uh, you know it's funny we're talking about connecting things all over all over texas and all over you know different areas robert rodriguez of course based here in austin where i'm at uh and uh, does a lot of his filming here so that'll be really neat to hear about i hope that i, I can't wait to see that progress uh, the progress on that project 
Oh yeah, the TV series is going to be done. It's going to be made in Texas. It's in you know, his his neck of the woods. Well, our our neck of the woods, you know. So uh, and uh, so he's got plenty of uh, playground to to play in on that. He's uh, really looking forward to it. And I f also found out that Robert was a big fan of the book uh, as well. So uh, he's been uh, something that he's been wanting to do for quite some time. And uh, looking forward to uh, working with him. And uh, and as far as the writers, uh, they got Eric Carrasco, who did uh, episode of uh, Supergirl, uh, Supergirl, and uh, Justice League Action, those uh, the animated series, as well as uh, Justice League versus um, versus the Fatal Five, uh, which just came out uh, this past year. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so um, I'm also going to be working with him on working on some uh, episodes on that. So it's a big, big uh, project. Uh, really excited to uh, be jumping the board on it. And I want to ask you guys real quick about your upcoming projects. Um, Javier, you're doing a, a new collection of Armarto, is that correct, or a new a graphic novel? Yeah, I'm doing a second graphic novel following up with the first one, Days of the Dead. The new one is called Casa del Diablo, which I think we see it on the screen here. So it's um, it literally takes place right after the end of the last book. Um, and it's uh, Diego de la Muerte, our hero. He's driving along the Rumerosa Highway from uh, Mexicali to Tijuana and comes across this uh, Llorona type character, La Doña Maclovia La Dolente, and this... Um, Character, creature from Aztec mythology, a star demon. So, um, really excited to be working on that. And, it's uh, a man. Look for that by the end of the year, you know, if everything works out. And uh, so, uh, and then, Richard, you're also doing uh, a new collection, I guess. While, the, while Javier's is, is a sequel, yours is a collection of some of your greatest hits, right? So, what, what are you working on right now? <laughs> yes, yes. It's the El Gato Negro Nocturnal Warrior collection, the beginning. And it's the uh, back issues of issues one through four and uh, EGN Nocturnal Warrior Legacy book one, plus unfinished and un unfinished story and arc of uh, book Legacy uh, book two, the first nine, nine pages of it, and some plus some special features in there of uh, unpublished work. And with a forward uh, written by uh, Professor uh, Latinx himself, uh, Frederick uh, Aldama. So uh, it's a uh, it's a project. It's I'm I'm scheduled to hopefully get this out by the summer of this year. Um, and following the um, a second graphic novel about the same length, uh, 120 plus pages of uh, El Gato Negro, the graphic novel uh, setting the stages. And it's a, it's going to be a one complete story but uh, has some, some Easter eggs in there of uh, supporting characters and new uh, super villains for the Nocturnal Warrior. And, uh, and I'm doing all the story and art for that one there too, and I've hopefully to, uh, to get that out by the following year. When you say Easter eggs, uh, does that include uh, call outs to other Latino characters and creators? Yeah, uh, well, uh, it, the story was going to take place like the, um, it picks up where it left off in the War of Independence, uh, done by uh, fellow creator uh, Dave Ryan, which had El Gato Negro with other uh, independent characters. But this is why, this is story picks up while he left the, the, the War of Independence and doesn't know what to do with himself, whether he wants to carry on to carry the mantle for his grandfather or uh, uh, just stop and be, you know have a life and, and not pursue the, the mantle. And at the same time, uh, two, two drug lords fight for supremacy in, in South Texas and then he doesn't know what to do from there, you know, so it gives, gives him a big decision on what to do, whether to uh, carry on the legacy or, you know, just, you know, hang it up and, and have his own private life on there. So. The reason or I his third, his third, his go ahead, Javier. Option, go to Hollywood and be a, a you know, TV star. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it comes yeah. down to. Yes, yes. Well, the reason I asked about the, the cameos from other characters is I know that there's there's always been a lot of support within the community. You mentioned a lot in the early 90s. I know a lot of creators right now are, are super excited. I was looking at some of the comments <laughs> here. The guys from Five Meats uh, who do some great stuff out of Brownsville. 
uh, were commenting that they love that when you na named out Brownsville there. Um, and you also have some other upcoming projects, Richard, where you're doing uh, Aztec mythology. Yes, um, I'm coming up with uh, one called Tonatu the the Almighty, uh, and it's based. It's you know it's like uh, the the Mighty Thor, but using Aztec mythology there. And uh, and if you're a big fan of uh, Shazam, uh, Firestorm, uh, Thor, the the new gods. Uh, this this is a book for you, and it's going to be a uh, uh, story. is about a ten year old little boy who uh, lives in Mexico City. He's a guide for these uh, Aztec ruins, and then he uh, stumbled upon some ancient amulets that he wears on him. And then when he clangs the amulet bracelets together, he becomes uh, Tanatu the Almighty, the uh, the fifth and current son. Uh, the he is known as the Sun God. On there, so and he has uh, superpowers, and then he uh, tries to reunite with his fellow gods in the thirteen heavens uh, of Aztec mythology, and uh, so and then he's like torn between dead and earthbound with this little boy that shares the body with him, and uh, and it's a big project that I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's a character I created long before the Nocturnal Warrior back in my uh, uh, college days on uh, so and it's he's coming out to life and uh, I hope that the uh, fans who are big lovers of Aztec mythology would will get into this this series hey Richard I had a question okay are you drawing digitally nowadays or are you still doing you know what we call old-fashioned hand-drawn art oh I'm I'm old school Javier I'm old school uh, I do everything by hand, and then I just enhance it with uh, with uh, Photoshop on in the computer. On there. But uh, yeah, you, you, color you, you, color you gotta color. trust this, man. You gotta trust this. You know, I'm old school. <laughs> like well, like like to create comics just like the pioneers. You know, so well tying to that. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. At the end of the day, I got to have ink on my fingertips, and I feel like I got something done worthwhile. That's when you know you've been ink. accomplished. Ink, ink runs in through my body here, you know. <laughs> yeah. Talk about uh, ink and, and doing it physically. Uh, I was telling Richard earlier, I have my sketchbook. I take this everywhere I go, and I ask artists that I respect to do a little uh, – respect artists who I love, all of them, will, if they will draw on it. And – Right next to each other, I have these two drawings. So I have that and that right there. So that's just pretty cool. Proud to have those. All right. Yeah. Um, well, have you guys thought about it, what's up, Javier? Sorry, what's that? I didn't see it, but I suspect what they are. <laughs> that's fine. Um, hey, have either of you guys thought about releasing or tried to release your comics digitally? Like, you know, Comixology or, or something like that where people can read it on their phone or computer? I well, thought about it. I mean, I definitely want to do it. I just haven't sat down and you know done that process yet. I'm definitely not against getting out digitally. Obviously, in fact, you're probably losing some audience members by not. Um, but you know, time wise, I just haven't done that yet. That's all I can say. You know, gotta get to I, it. I I share the same with Javier. I haven't got to do it, but with this pandemic going on here. And and the uh, comic readers got to have their comics. You know, they we gotta help them get that fix. Uh, try to do it, uh, you know, is any way possible um, with this collection book. I was thinking about doing it either in comicology or you know uh, with uh, Amazon uh, KDP, which is uh, Kindle, going straight to uh, digital, or you know they can order their copies and uh, have. Uh, Mr. Postman come by and drop it off for them, you know? Yeah, I, I love having the physical books, but there's something to be said about the uh, convenience of being able to pick it up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm a physical book lover myself here, too. I like to, I like to grab a hold of what what's really good, you know, in between your hands. Richard, we need to become uh, cyber dealers, though, you know? We got to get those uh, that new market. Yes, yes, it's another thing we got to conquer, you know, so uh, we conquer everything else and might as well go, you know, further. You know. 
we have other comments here. People asking, hey, maybe you should uh, debut your new comics at some of the upcoming Latino Comic Con, especially the Latino Comics Expo. The idea being that once this pandemic is settled-ish, that we can actually, you know, collect and gather again and show these off. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you guys a question. Um, talking about making comics into movies, have you guys ever, well, let me ask, what, what are your favorite comic book movies or least favorite? <laughs> Why do I go? I got too many least favorites, but I'm going to have to go with favorite. Um, I mean, that original Superman, the first two Christopher Reeve Superman films, and then the first uh, the first two Batman movies, the Tim Burton ones. Um, those are like always, always like favorites year in, year out, maybe more so every year. But um, but then I, I like a lot of, you know, all the smattering of different ones over the years. I mean, I love the first, I love the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. And um, oh. I love the Speed Racer movie that nobody else loved. Um, <laughs> so what about you, Richard? What's, uh, what do you, which ones do you dig? Well, I have to share that the same thing with you. I'm a big fan of the, when Batman first came out back in 89, uh, Tim Burton, the first two at least. And then uh, I don't know what happened after that uh, on there. And then uh, uh, I like the Watchmen <laughs> uh, on there. Uh, Alan Moore's uh, The Watchmen uh, movie that, that came out a few years back. And then uh, on oh, as far as TV series is concerned, I'm a big fan of Daredevil, especially the Brian Cox uh, one. Uh, that's uh, really, really one of my favorites on there. So. Also got a question here. Are they ever going to make a movie out of uh, Rampalango? I can never say that properly. <laughs> the, the judge's comic. Relampago, it's not that. Uh, <laughs> uh, lightning. I uh, don't know too much about that. Uh, although the the estate there, uh, of course, you know the judge passed away, mm -hmm. and then uh, his wife, uh, his widow, right, right there, is uh, you know it's closing all all everything off on there. Although I'm sure that his children wants to see it happen, but they're just respecting uh, the mother's wishes on there because it just reminds him too much of the of her, her husband so i mean i i i didn't make the, the character come out as a cameo appearance in my first four original books on there and, and was trying to make you know resurface him on there but uh after that i you know was speaking with the garza estate uh on there they i kind of respect their wishes not to pursue it well, the question also came in. Do you think a story about the judge himself would be good? Like maybe a comic book, uh, autobi or rather not autobiographical, a biographical comic book about him or a movie? It seems like he had a pretty interesting life. He did. He was. Uh, he. Uh, I met him, and uh, I was very fortunate to to uh, to uh, share share a, uh, a table with him there when uh, he uh, had his comic book store. He was. Uh, he was a ball of fire. He was a ball of fire, and uh, he had he was a uh, a fiery spirit there, and had his opinion about everything, including the comic book industry and who, who he liked and who he didn't like. <laughs> so, but uh, and but he was uh, a a great influence, and uh, I sure hate to be in his courtroom uh, being sentenced. <laughs> You know, so he, he'll, he'll tell you like it is. Yeah. Well, with that, a, go ahead. He's a very important figure, though. Definitely, you're right, Kevin. I mean, a biography or even autobiography uh, comic. I mean, he. I'm pretty sure he's the first Mexican American to uh, uh, self-publish a comic book. Um, if I understand the history of uh, of this, and I actually do a lecture series called uh, "Culture and Comics" mm -hmm. at libraries and such, where you know I run through. A, uh, you know, short history of Latino creators in the American market. And um, yeah, by the time he comes around in uh, 77 with his first issue, I think that's the first example of um, a Mexican-American, you know, self-publishing their own work. Whoa, sorry, knock that out, out of the way. Which, you know, inspired the whole line. We've got Richard here and, you know, Carlos. Well, then we have the Hernandez brothers, you know, Jaime and Beto and Mario doing Love and Rockets and so on and so forth. So... Well, that's why we get classics like El Muerto and El Gato Negro. 
nice images you got up there, by the way. I like this. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful art. I don't know who the artists are. I don't know. They were really, really good artists there. Wow. Yeah. Guys. You know, the image you have of El Muerto on the screen there, mm -hmm. um, when, when you watch the film, that's the, that image. Man, I remember in the theater to see it on the screen. That image shows up, and then it goes into, I think, the title or the beginning of the film. So that, that was a... Uh, it's nice seeing your um, not just your character on the screen by an actor, but your actual drawn artwork like that size in the theater. It's, it was pretty cool. Brings brings a chill down down your spine, doesn't it? No. Yes, absolutely. Guys, I want to thank you both so much. It's been amazing talking to both of you, and I, I'm honored that we were able to get this to happen and that we were able to do it live. So that's pretty cool, all the way around the world. What, what time is it for you, Richard? It's uh, now it's about a quarter to one. Yeah. <laughs> one in the morning. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow, yeah, man. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, my kids are still up. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, tell them that. Like, hey, hey, Netflix time is over. So. <laughs> right. So, hey, well, it was great. Uh, uh, it was great to be able to talk to Richard. I haven't seen him in a while, and um, same know, here. Kevin, thanks for hosting us and yes, putting thank us you. together on the same you know same uh, show. It's, it's really exciting. So thank you. And um, anyone out there, you know, all the younger artists, everybody's younger than me and Richard now, but everybody out there, especially Latino creators, uh, you know, guys and gals, whatever. Everybody, if you want to do your own comic, you know, on your own, be prepared. You know, for the hard work, hard work, like my friend Raphael Navarro says, the world doesn't owe you a favor. That's really important to know. Yes. I'm not saying that to discourage people, but you really got to know that. But knowing that, you know, get it out there. Make sure you want to get your vision, your idea out there in the marketplace. I mean, you know. Yes, it's yes I agree. I agree. Just don't talk. Just do it. You know, just do it. You know, and, and, and see what you you can. Uh, you have a great feeling run once you finish it, and uh, yeah. the load will will be off you. You know, and then it just goes. You know, uh, up from in, in there. The way, in the way, that's when the job starts. Though, once you get those boxes in your driveway of the comics, I think that's when it really starts. Now you got to get it out there. <laughs> Oh man, I used to have those. I used to have boxes that I could I could make into furniture, you know, armchair and table, you know. Right. <laughs> and I used to eat off those boxes. So, so. yeah, beautiful. Thank you guys both so much. Uh, with that, we're going to be wrapping up a bit. Thank you so much again. This has been Mono Mythic. I thank all of our viewers, and we're going to. Put, when we put this on YouTube, put all the additional information so people can find these comics and find these movies. And I hope to see you guys again. Thank you all so much. Bye. <laughs>